Friends, let us be called together in worship uh, through prayer. The Lord be with you. And also, also with you. you. Let us pray. Holy God, as we stand in the midst of the city with the sound of waters and the sound of traffic, we are thankful for your call to us to meet you at the intersection of life and faith. On this Friday, we call good we are reminded that in our baptism, we are united with you in death. That we might join with you in resurrection to new life. We pray that your spirit will fill this day and this time. That the witness we offer might point to our Lord Jesus Christ that might glorify him on this day when the world sought to shame him. For his weakness reveals your strength. And our strength is found in you. And all God's people say, Amen. To start today, I thought we'd offer a reading from 1 Corinthians. The first chapter, I don't know that the American church has much in common with the Corinthian church. They had a bunch of church fights, disputes. <laughs> we don't have any of that. They had some people who thought they were holier than others and distinguished themselves on that basis. We don't have any of that. They had debates about human sexuality. We don't have any of that. Yeah. They had wealthy people ignoring the needs of the poor in their community. We don't have any of that. Through Paul's words to them, listen for God's word to us. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We're joined on Good Friday, and I find myself just about every year wondering why we call it Good Friday. What is the good news of Good Friday? Some say it's from the German for God's Friday, Goldstreetag, maybe so. Remembering the events of that first Friday, though, it's hard to say that it was a day that belonged to God. It certainly seemed as if the powers of the world prevailed that first Good Friday. How was that God's Friday? The day that we remember the brutal execution of God's chosen Messiah, call God's Friday? Seems foolish. 
And looking at the world today, it would be hard to say that this day belongs to God. This past week, here in Texas, over a thousand homes were destroyed by tornadoes. Thankfully, no one was killed, but thousands of lives have been turned upside down. And here in the Dallas area this week, the body of an 11-year-old boy who was starved to death by his father and stepmother was discovered unthinkable, not unimaginable. Last night, as Christians remembered Bondi Thursday, as our congregation met here in this garden, a public hearing was being held at the library right down the street, where speakers railed against the construction of supportive housing for the homeless. Why they think that providing housing for people who are homeless will make the neighborhood worse, I don't know. That's foolishness. And this morning's paper featured a front page article about the exoneration of three men who have served over 20 years in prison for a crime they did not commit. In this era of mass incarceration, I wonder how many more of the 2.3 million Americans who are behind bars are innocent. Is this God's day? Foolishness. On the global stage, over 60 people killed in Syria yesterday, civil war raging in Mali, continuing tensions between Iran and Israel. The United States is halfway through its 12th year of a war in Afghanistan, the longest war in our history. Even the Russians were smart enough to get out after nine years. Foolishness. Can we really say this day belongs to God? Is this a good Friday? You'd have to be a fool to say that. Substitutionary or satisfaction theories of the atonement say that this Friday is good because Jesus died for our sins, or that his death pays the price for our salvation, or as Isaiah puts it, by his stripes we are healed. And some of the scriptures certainly affirm these theories, but I wonder who this death was for, what kind of a God needs the brutal death of an innocent man to appease for my mistakes? Truth be told, Jesus died because of our sin, not simply for it. If this is all that Good Friday is about, I think we should change the name to Guilt Friday, because that's all we'd be left with, is guilt. Surely the cross does teach us that God is with all who suffer this day, particularly all who suffer unjustly, as so many of these signs name. And there is good news in that. Those who suffer are not alone. Even more, those who would follow Christ are told again and again that we must pick up our cross and follow Him. History refers to this as the moral example theory of the atonement. And indeed, we are called to solidarity with all who suffer in this world, if we call ourselves Christian. Is this good news, or is this just the cost of discipleship? If discipleship is only about joining Christ on the cross, where is the good news in that? Some would say, that's foolishness. That's how Paul put it. The message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And therein lies the question for this Good Friday. If this day is simply about perishing, it is foolish to call it Good Friday. But to those who believe, this day is about the power of God. The power of God to unmask the powers of this world for what they are, the powers of sin and violence and death. The power of God's self-giving love to conquer those self-serving powers that seem to rule the world. The power of God that proclaims Christ's death, indeed our call to take up that same cross, means the end of the self-serving world as we know it. It's not simply about perishing. It's about being saved. Salvation begins with the death of the self-serving powers 
that possess our lives and our world. And so this Good Friday, this God's Friday, let us together proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to some and foolishness to others, but to those who are called Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. In the end, friends, that's the good news. This good fact. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. We're going to uh, begin the walk now, and for those of you who are joining us for the first time, uh, we'll walk on the sidewalks and we'll obey the, uh, the traffic lights. So if the group gets separated, please know that the first part of the group will wait until the traffic light changes so that everybody can, can catch up and be together. So because we don't want anybody running across the, the, the street against the traffic. Um, we'll have uh, two different stops where or, there'll be other reflections and we'll make basically a circle in the downtown area and come back to City Hall for our final reflection. So I would encourage you to look out for each other, walk single file, follow the cross, and you won't be lost. <laughs> As we begin our walk, we are inspired by the words of Dr. Ruben Habito, who provided reflection for two of our previous walks. This is Good Friday. Today we have powerful images on our mind that we came here to relive. We have images of the cross and the suffering of our Savior, Jesus Christ, upon it. The Eucharist that Christians celebrate has the central words, this is my body given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. As Jesus offered his body for all of us, we are also invited to reflect upon these words and make them our own. This is my body given for us. As we walk, let us be mindful of the weight Christ carried. Let us be mindful that Christ carried the weight of all sin, of all suffering, of all injustice in this way of the cross. Let us be mindful of all the destruction and promises of the world that He bore on His shoulders and upon His body on Good Friday. Let us remember for whom and for what Christ suffered, for whom and for what Christ died, for the one in 100 incarcerated, for those who live with hunger every day, for those in pain because of the way they are treated by others. Let us listen to them and respond, this is my body given for you. As we walk from station to station, 
we remember to be mindful that we walk in meditation so as to bring our attention fully to the present. With each step, be aware of a bodily presence as we walk with one another, of the presence of those for whom and for what we represent. They are the sick, those who lack access to clean water, the unemployed and the underemployed, not just for those in the U.S., but for those throughout the world. They are on the cross today. For whom and for what is indicated in the signs we are carrying. They are all the 25,000 to 30,000 children under the age of five, the 11 to 12 million people per year who die daily because of hunger, malnutrition, and related causes. They are the people who are called refugees, who are displaced from their homes because of threats to their lives due to violence of war, because of political and social economic issues. They are people who are not regarded as humans by their fellow human beings for reasons of race, ethnicity, color of skin, religion, or sexual orientation. Let us have the world that God created and loves in our minds and in our hearts as we walk each step. And with each step, we are invited to breathe with and walk with those for whom and for what we represent. Breathe in and breathe out. Feeling each breath as a gift from the same source that gave us this life. In our Christian heritage, we know it as a spiritus sanctus, or sacred breath. The spiritus from the Latin verb esperare, to breathe. Or the Hebrew, the ruah, is that breath that makes the earth what it is. The breath that is all of our fellow living sentient beings that we receive. So let us pay attention to that breath. Remembering for whom and for what we are carrying these signs. And with whom we are breathing and walking in this way. We will experience more profoundly this Good Friday walk. Let us walk in this meditative way so that we may experience more fully the significance of Christ's actions on the cross. I thank all of you who are here for sharing in the bond of Christ that he freely gives to us through his love and grace and salvation, a path in which we follow.
God of glory, we call upon you, humbly asking that you be with us in our time of need. As Jesus said to us, justice and mercy and faith, it is all of these that we must practice and all are important. Let us attend to the weightier matters of the law. And please read, and you can also not read and have to read the, the verse, but just the, what's important. Justice, Justice, mercy, and faith. We commit to embrace all three. Our world is broken. The earth cracked and shattered, and destruction lies all around. Our humanity is ruptured, and relationships are torn asunder. We fail to recognize the face of our sister and brother and turn a blind eye to their suffering. That which we do to the least of these, we do to Jesus. We live in a world where the few have so much and the many so little, where the basic needs of food, water, shelter, and medicine are distributed to those who already have and not enough to those in need. Help us to work to become a blessed nation. In our world, the greedy and entitled use their positions to enrich themselves at the expense of others. Corruption runs rampant, and power is employed by some of the wealthy to exploit and oppress and withdraw their support from the common good. For much is given, much shall be required. Across the nation, violence is too often the means by which problems are addressed. Fist, gun, and bomb are the tools of the trades that traffic in death and destruction. An unarmed 17-year-old boy and many like him die when we allow fear to consume us. We must listen to Jesus who tells us, Be not afraid, and blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Come down from the mountaintop, O God. Incline your ear to our human condition. Hear our prayer, O God. For we know with you all things can be made new. What is broken can be repaired. What is ruptured can be reconciled. Inspire us to be your agents of mercy. Working for justice and mercy. And bringing healing to the world that desperately needs to be. May God bless us with discomfort and easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships, so that we may live from deep within our hearts. May God bless us with anger and injustice, oppression, and exploitation of God's creations, so that we may work for justice, freedom, and peace. Let the people say, Amen. Amen.
maybe you're familiar. I bet I've been in some stuff with him, there's no doubt. He's discussion drifts into politics and social issues, where you are likely to hear complaints about progressive Christians that we are simply tools of the left. You are likely to hear complaints of, about socialism, big government, and the great dangers that our society faces. You are likely to hear some of their favorite scriptures such as, quote, God loves a cheerful giver. The implication is that God's requirements of all of us are somehow optional. That giving is somehow optional. Like an elective college class. Maybe basket weaving. The implication that if we are cheerful, we should give. If not cheerful, maybe we're having a bad day, then no. It all depends on how we feel. No doubt you have heard conservative friends say this to you. Additionally, maybe you've heard it said that when Jesus talks about the demand to give back to society, that Jesus is only talking about believers. Believers are supposed to be these cheerful givers. Therefore, social spending by the government, even if it accomplishes things that Jesus might have believed in, that spending is evil or wrong. Therefore, the only people that ever have to give are givers who just happen to be cheerful Christians. A subset of a subset. <laughs> sometimes they not only use actual scripture to justify their position, sometimes they use pretend things that are not really in the Bible. My favorite example of this comes from my wife. She works at one of the courthouses you just passed upstairs, uh, the George Allen Courthouse. Bless their hearts, people assume that because she's married to me, she'll just know everything about the Bible. So one day, <laughs> Uh, someone came up to her and said, "Hey, Judge, where's that passage in the Bible that says, give a man to f give a man a fish, feed him today; teach a man to fish, feed him for a lifetime." 
Denise awkwardly paused and said, uh, well, that's not in the Bible. <laughs> this person looked back at her like, oh, you poor thing, you don't know your own Bible. <laughs> then she said, do you think you could ask Eric? <laughs> and he said, no, it's really not in the Bible, I promise you. I swear that person spent the rest of the day trying to Google that. <laughs> It's funny how folks don't know what's in the Bible somehow and use these non-biblical sources to try to illustrate what Jesus really said. But I will tell you something that is in the Bible. It's the passage that Ron and Kim told me was our key for this day. To whom much is given, much is required. Can you come down here with that sign and let us all see that sign? Ron and Kim told me this was one of our themes for the day, so I'd like to key on this. Repeat after this sign. For unto whom much is given, much shall be required. Well, maybe this just applies to Christians, they will say. Funny you should mention that. In Luke 12, where this happens, Peter asks that same question. Peter says, hey, are you talking to us, or are you talking to everyone? He actually says that exact question. Now, Jesus has just finished telling them to sell all their possessions and give it to the poor. Jesus has just told them to not worry about their lives, what they will eat, what they will drink. Jesus has just finished telling them, just finished telling them about the man who built bigger barns so that he could hoard all of his stuff. And then Peter says, so are you talking to us or are you talking to everyone? And Jesus tells one final story and he concludes with this line right here. Say it again. For I do much again, much shall be required. Jesus' answer is, yes, it's both and. I am talking to you Christians, but I am also talking to everyone. To everyone. Giving is not option. Giving is not just when we feel like it. Giving is not simply a requirement of God's faithful band of disciples, but something for all God's children. That is why the parable of the Last Judgment is a judgment of the nations, not of individuals. Back last year, <coughs> after Apple computer Steve Jobs died, I read a beautiful column by Frida Gitas, a columnist at the Miami Herald. And in her column, she linked two very interesting things that were happening in the culture at right that moment. The death of Steve Jobs, and the Occupy Wall Street movement. And she made a very astute observation. She noted that while people in our country today do seem to be angry at the rich and the wealthy, almost nobody was angry with Steve Jobs. At his death, people seemed to see him as an innovator, creator of the iPhone, the iPad, the Mac. And Frida Gita suggested that Americans have not always hated the rich, but instead have admired them and hoping that it one day they might join their ranks. But she pointed out this very astute point, that there is a covenant with, that Americans have always had with our wealthy, which says this, yes, you absolutely may become extremely wealthy, but you must also bear the risks and pay the prices for any mistakes. And so she ends with this, quote, incredibly in 2008, Despite hundreds of billions of taxpayer, taxpayer bailouts, trillions of losses for investors, Wall Street firms paid $18 billion in bonuses. The average bonus in the large firm was $260,000. $265,000 for the bonus. In 2010, the average bonus was $128,000. That's on top of salary, options, and other perks. driving Christians and non-Christians alike completely bonkers. What is making us so frustrated in our society is not that there are wealthy people, but how out of touch so many in our society have become. That their jobs, their livelihood has been saved, bailed out literally by the rest of us. Their success far too often leveraged not just on deals in stocks and bonds, but literally on the backs of the poor. But as Jesus says, for unto whom much is given, much shall be required. We still live in one of the wealthiest lands in the world. If you have air conditioning in your home, if you drove a car here today, 
If you even went to college for one solitary day, you are among the wealthiest people in the world. And to you and to all of us, Jesus says, For unto whom much is given, much shall be required. In the city of Dallas, which somehow finds the money to build that luxury hotel right over there, but cannot seem to fix potholes or provide social services to the poor, Jesus says, For unto whom much is given, much shall be required. In a state of Texas dripping with natural resources and tons of millions of smart people, we are always ranked dead last in statistical categories dealing with women, children, and the poor. Jesus says to us, For unto whom much is given, much is required. And I do love my Apple computers, but to Apple and to the many companies sitting on mounds of cash the size of China, rolling in corporate profits while closing down factories here, Jesus says, For unto whom much is given, much shall be required. And in our nation, blessed with a constitutional system of law guaranteeing our freedoms and our safety, somehow we have tolerated a young man being gunned down for wearing a hoodie and carrying Skittles. Jesus says, For unto whom much is given, much shall be required. Giving is not optional, not just when we feel like it. And we have gathered here this day to remember these words of Jesus, to hold ourselves accountable, to hold our city and our nation accountable. Jesus, who we remember this day, gave up not just his property and his stuff, but his very life, everything that was demanded by the powers that be. This day, we remember that Jesus gave anything that was required. So on this Good Friday, God calls us this day to remember that we are similarly called to give, to love, to share, to care for God's beautiful creation, to trust that nothing given is ever lost. It is never in vain. It is never foolish. For God's story never ends in death or even in sacrifice, but in resurrection. And even on this Good Friday, we give thanks and we trust in that work. Amen. 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 Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for the chance to gather here. We give you thanks for the chance to witness to your city, to your truth. May we be your witnesses. May others join us. May we truly help you to mold the society that you would have here on earth to love the least and the lost, to remember that much is required of all of us. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>